Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming to the second presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce Hamish Colgan. Hamish has always liked to bend hardware to his will, which led to a career in a sysadmin, career as a sysadmin, and means he is always looking inside the case. Hamish currently lives in Melbourne, in a cupboard under the stairs, where he tends to his various pet computers. Thank you very much, Hamish. Thanks for coming. Um, this is my first LCA talk at the main conference, so... Uh... <laughs> if you have any questions, can you leave them to the end? Uh, I expect to have time, but it would be best. And the slides will be online after I finish the talk. So, who am I? Um, as uh, Rob said, I'm a system programmer. Some might call it a DevOps these days, but, you know, I've been calling a sysadmin for years, so there you go. I'm not actually living in a small box in Melbourne anymore. Now I live in a small apartment in Hong Kong, so it's changed since I wrote the talk proposal. Um, and in this talk, I want to talk you through a couple of different things. I'm going to try and encourage you to be able to make changes to the hardware you see around you and get you back into the mentality of questioning whether or not your shiny new toy is right for you. What can I change is the question. Not hey, it's shiny, it's awesome, I don't want to leave it, I don't want to touch it. So why did I start my fight? I don't think that hardware is meeting my requirements anymore. I certainly don't want cheaper hardware at the expense of quality, which seems to be the option that we're getting a lot of the time. Um, and I don't like feeling like I'm using things that don't suit me. It's really not something I want to have to pay money for to get something that I then end up saying, oh, it's, it's kind of all right. It does what I want, but it could be better. So I want you to feel like you could do something against that. I certainly want to feel like I could do something against that. So not that I say could. I don't expect everybody to run out and go and pull apart their keyboard or hack some other thing that they've thought of. I want you to feel like you can. And that's something that I think is important that we continue to have as time goes on. Um, there we go. So laptops do seem to be getting smaller, which is good. But they're not always getting smaller in the right way. You end up losing things like various ports. Um, and I've looked at other ranges of laptops, but historically, I've used ThinkPad laptops. I've had a lot of ThinkPad laptops, and they all basically suit what I needed previously. I've looked at other ranges of laptops, and they seem to have the same kind of effects happening different times, but the same effect. Um, I don't want to end up with a laptop with no keyboard, but I don't think anybody does. I try to sit down and work out what my ideal laptop was while preparing for this talk, because you know, otherwise, why am I doing this? What have I got as a target? And I came up with a number of options for what I needed. And it's really an ideal laptop. There are a whole lot of things here that can't be achieved. There's a whole lot of things that can be achieved, though. Easily portable is my definition of a laptop. For instance, I look at laptops with a, ThinkPad, uh, with a keypad on the side, and I go, that's big. I don't want big. I want small. So I've already narrowed down what kind of laptop I want. I can plug in a keyboard if I actually need a keypad. The laptop that has no blobs would be ideal. But not anybody can do that at the moment with a modern laptop. Even there's a company out there, Purism, that actually had that as their intent. And they still can't get rid of all the blobs in their laptop. Although there's been some movement on that since I wrote this slide. I don't know that they are actually shipping anything that has no management engine blob, just as an example. And I want it to actually be a laptop. I was really excited when the Novena laptop was a, as an option except that it's not actually a laptop. It's a portable computer. So again, I've narrowed it down to things that I think would be useful for me to have, which means that the scope of what I'm actually trying to change can be narrowed down as well. First, address something on my list of things that I like. What can I change from that list? And I can't build a whole laptop. I've only got a certain amount of skills. So I'm left with the two things that are important to me is the ergonomics of using a laptop all day. The screen, 
There's a lot of people out there with projects to replace screens on their laptops. There's a lot of aftermarket options. That's not actually a problem that needs solving, I don't think. And the keyboard of the newer ThinkPad range didn't meet with my idea of what I wanted in the laptop. So what could I do about the keyboard? Can I change it? I don't know if everybody has seen a ThinkPad keypad, but I've had them for a long time. I own every keyboard you see here. I own the laptops behind them as well. But they've had pretty much the same keyboard for 20 years, up until 2011. And then they changed. They changed fairly significantly. There were changes in the laptops before this point, and there are changes in the laptops after this point as well. You can see some of the changes with the um, weird laptop up here, where they did rather surprising things, like um, decide that some keys needed to replace the caps lock key. But they also did things that other members of the industry thought they'd do uh, recently with the Apple uh, removing the function keys. They left the escape key in, but you know, it's a keyboard with a number of strange design decisions. And I'm looking at things like this and I said, well, if this is the way it's going, I really do need to work on what I can do because I had some ideas about what I wanted in my keyboard. I actually liked the, um, the old keyboard and the keycaps, the way they weren't island keys. But more importantly, they had a very nice feel, they had a lot of travel, they had the ability for me to type on them all day, and 20 years of muscle memory of knowing where the keys are. So when you change it, this is the very next model on the right here, when you change it, they changed it quite significantly, which wasn't what I wanted. So what could I replace? Turns out that the keyboard connector from those two models is identical. I can actually physically just plug the keyboard in, except there's a couple of issues. One I didn't notice until much later is that the keyboards on the newer laptop actually have a backlit keyboard. It's an option, but it's an option that's always on the motherboard, and the motherboard always sends high current voltage through the keyboard connector. Um, this needed to be pointed out to me. Uh, it took a while for me to be able to actually see it. I didn't believe it until I could see it, and apparently I was lucky that when the high, high current went through the, uh, my keyboard, I burnt a little tiny hole in it in the right spot. Other people have had things like their mouse keys stop working when this happened. So I did this to several keyboards and they all had the same failure mode and I crossed my fingers and hoped that the rest of the world had the same answer. But there's uh, somebody out there who pointed this out to me and said, here's how to fix it. You need to insulate these pins so it doesn't actually affect it. Um, after I've solved that problem by blowing up some tracks on my keyboard, I still had some problems. The difference between the number of rows on the keyboard meant that they had to rearrange the keyboard matrix, which meant there were some dead keys. There were some keys that had the wrong thing happen when you pressed them. A lot of the fin key combos didn't quite, quite do what they said on the box anymore. And there were some keys that didn't work at all, like the, the new keyboard doesn't have a caps lock key, the old keyboard, uh, caps lock light the old keyboard did. Some people had their own answers for this, which I looked at and said, that's rather laborious, attacking it with a razor blade and pulling it apart and rewiring the actual matrix on the keyboard wasn't error free. I thought there's gotta be another way of doing this. I found some schematics and they showed me that in fact all of the keys were still connected. It's a different embedder controller on the new laptop than the old one but all the keys are still physically connected. It's all just software that's causing the problem. So if this was open source, I would just patch it and it would just work and that would be the end of it. It wouldn't be a big story. Since it's not open source, I looked at what I could do. The internet has a dump of a ThinkPad firmware from 10 years ago. It's about, um, it's, it has most of the same information in there. So I was able to use that to try and look for the keyboard table in the, somebody else's disassembly. They've reverse engineered it too. It's not actually perfect. And say, okay, that's what the keyboard looked like 10 years ago. 
in the firmware. What does the keyboard table look like in modern firmware? So I got my current laptop and I got my new laptop with the right and the wrong keyboard and I found the keyboard table and I said, good, it's all fantastic. I can patch this. Those of you who saw the previous talk know that you can't just patch the firmware. It has signatures, so I can't, can't act on this. I've got a patch, but no way to install it. Now, I've said I'm working on the embedded firmware here that I'm de looking at. You might not all know what the embedded firmware is. The embedded firmware runs on the embedded controller. The embedded controller is another computer inside your computer, a very small one, and it's plugged into the keyboard and the battery, and the mouse, and the fans, and many other things that I don't know about. So I pulled out the internet, and eventually somebody else had actually worked out how to fix the signature. So thanks, Matt. You should have seen his talk. I won't explain it all for you. Go and have a look at the video. But if you mid-miss it, what he did is he worked out how to take that firmware, reverse engineer the encryption, and the signatures, and allow us to then repack it up with a patch applied. Great, now I can install the patch. Well, not really, because it didn't actually work. Some of the keys moved around, some of the keys didn't. Some of the keys just didn't come live with the patch that should have fixed it all, according to my keyboard table. So that's when I actually started saying, okay, I'm gonna to have to reverse engineer this. I'll need a tool to do this. I'll need a tool that supports the firmware, uh, the, the hardware that the firmware is running, which is this Arc Compact system. Rad Air, a tool that is used for reverse engineering, has support for that. I opened it up and I said, awesome, I can look at this. I looked straight at this and I said, um, that looks like a mess. And if, if it looks like a mess to me, sorry, if it looks like a mess to you because you don't know what you're looking at, it looks more like a mess to me because these arrows should point somewhere and they should do something. Turns out that Red Air didn't actually support this CPU very well. So I had to improve it. In order to actually successfully reverse engineer the firmware, I ended up going off and yak shaving. I had to rewrite the analysis tool for Red Air and most of the analysis engine that they used for this CPU tool was written for a different architecture, it was written for an older version, with only minimally support for the one I was working on. And while I implemented a fair bit, I only took the low hanging fruit. I only took just enough to make sure that I could actually see what I was doing. Because when I'd finished doing my, my reverse engineering, the arrows looked better. A lot of it looks better as well, but that's a very visible thing to me. I can look at that and I can say, okay, they're pointing at things that make sense. And the things they're pointing at over here are actually places that you'd have arrows coming from and to, jump targets, jump sources. So I can go back to actually looking for my keyboard tables. And much of the code analysis I was doing was looking for the caps lock light and how did the actual BIOS program the, uh, the firmware, which wasn't the keyboard tables. So I needed to go and look further for the keyboard tables rather than distracting myself with code, which is where I actually, because I spent a lot of time rewriting the Red Hair CPU module, I ended up having to learn how Red Hair works. Not completely, it's a very big tool. It's written in, they say, the kind of flavor of a Unix tool where it's a lots of little tools you can combine together. But every tool is cryptic and you have to learn all of them. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the things I did to actually get Red Air working. Well, use Red Air, working with Red Air. So this is the, the table I found with my matching with the 10 year old firmware. So this is actually the hex dump of the keyboard table, which I'm fairly confident it's the keyboard table. So I've given it a name down here. I've told Red Hair it's this size at this offset and give it a name. And once I've got that named, I can say, where else 
refers to this table. There must be something in the code that jumps to this table and looks into the table. I found one hit. I'm like, oh, hey, this is simple. We can move on from here. So I had the same look, the same hex dump of around that area where I can see there's my hit. I'm looking through this and you stare at that for a while and you work out, oh, what is it saying me? Oh, okay, I'll look at this. That looks like it could be something. This could be something here. Maybe if I should look at it a different way. The red air can show it to me in a different way. If I show it as the CPU is a 32-bit CPU, so I'll show it as a series of 32-bit words. And, oh, look, that's the number of bytes in the keyboard table. That's a pointer to the keyboard table. What's this? It's a pointer to something nearby. So, again, I name this table that I found, point comments into some of it, and make it sure that Red Air knows that there are all four byte long quantities, 32 bits. And then go and have a look at the thing I've just found. It's just, I can see the thing I've just named, it's highlighted it for me, and I can see before it, ah, okay, I'm not really sure what that is, but it looks like it is 110 hex bits long. So it's the same size as the keyboard table. All right, I'm fairly sure I found something. Why don't I call it, it's a bitmap, and I can keep giving something a name. And if you keep doing that repeatedly, eventually you can print out what you've got, and it starts to make more sense. This is exactly the same list that I showed before, printed a different way, and you can see there's my comment about, oh, that must be the size, there's a pointer to the first table I found, there's a pointer to the second table I found, and there's some more work that I have to do. <laughs> I haven't found what that is at this point. And that's not the only tool you end up using for this. Hexdump, I hope most people have heard of. It's really good. Hexdump has an alias called HD, which I didn't actually know about until oh, a year ago, which shows the Hexdump in the format that I call Hexdump rather than the format that Unix calls Hexdump. So I use HD all the time. Then there's the bin diff which if you're downloading multiple different firmware versions and you're trying to work out what the differences are, it's really handy for diffing binary files. It also seems to be something that is not really well catered for in the tools that I've used. So when I found this, I said, great, I'll use this for that kind of thing as well. And then another tool which is my go-to for the first thing that I need to look at all the time is HTE, which is a hex editor as well as a hex viewer, as well as a disassembler, as well as a bit of an assembler. It's got advanced search tools. So this is the tool I use for searching for my keyboard table. It doesn't actually stand for anything magical. It says it's HT editor. I tried to work out, I knew somebody would say, what's HTE stand for? HT is what it stands for. Um, high, tech. high tech, why not? Binwalk is the final tool that I actually have on my top four. It's what I used to try and pull apart the firmware. And the fact that it didn't show me anything for this keyboard firmware was irrelevant because it's still the tool I used first. What's in this blob that I downloaded from Lenovo? And it shows you. It pulls apart all the contents of it, looks for the magic numbers, and shows you all the details in there. So it's like file, but on steroids. And it has an option for you to say, fill this directory with all the things you found and you end up with all the component parts. Which is really handy because some firmwares, it's turtles all the way down. One of those component parts, you'll need to pull apart again and pull out bin walk and do it again. So once I've got all my tools set up, I can continue looking for the structures that I need to actually fix the remaining keys on the keyboard. What I showed you before when walking through the red air command line ends up looking like this if you actually graph it out. And you keep going. You look for more tables. You keep following all those pointers and you look for more pointers. And you end up with more tables. There's a lot of them in the firmware. At this around about this point that I'm searching for various parts of the firmware that I hooked up with a guy called Nitrocaster. He found me through the internet basically because I posted on ZMAT's blog post he then searched me out and contacted me and said, hey, let's work on this. He'd found 
the live key bitmap, which is what I'd found as the bitmap before. And I've abbreviated enough that I can't actually point at anything here, sorry. That bitmap was the bing that turned on the dead keys. And after he did that, working together, we were able to find the other two tables that are needed. So this structure that you can see here contains the four tables that are actually needed to patch the firmware to make the old keyboard work. Once you've got those patches, you can actually get most of the functionality going. I've written most of this down in the docs for the repo that I put together for it, so hopefully other people can find the same things and patch them differently if they wanted to. There are a lot more tables in the firmware. This is the um, abbreviated version. This is just the stuff that comes from the keyboard table that I found right at the top there. Uh, I think the full graph is about three times this size. It's not many bytes, but there's a lot of stuff there. So, and it's very well organized. You can actually automatically, this is automatically generated, so if people wanted to go looking for what else is in there, a combination of that and the, old, uh, the 10 year old firmware that somebody else has disassembled might give you some more um, pointers. So, success. I did that. I patched my firmware, I installed the physical keyboard, and most of the keys work. As I said, there is no caps lock on the X230 keyboard. I couldn't find where the caps lock was configured in the firmware. It might not even be there. They might have compiled it out. So I don't have a caps lock like anymore. Um, there's a couple of other bits and pieces, like the, uh, the screen lock key doesn't work properly. It might work, but I don't use it, so I don't look at that. The hibernate key doesn't work properly for a different reason. I was a bit afraid to try and touch it in case I bricked my firmware. And I don't use Hibernate, so I didn't touch that. But basically all the keys are working. Which is where I said, okay, the two of us have worked together to produce this patch. We've succeeded in producing it. Let's get other people to help us. Or let's help them. We'll publish it. Nitrocaster starts up a thread on, on the ThinkPad forum and publishes the work that we've been able to do. We put forward to them all the hex offsets of the bytes they need to patch in their firmware. Um, they didn't really follow along. A lot of the people there wanted a little bit more information. And they wanted to know how they could do it themselves with that information. So we had to polish the project a bit. I collected together all the patches that we had put it together on a GitHub repo, published it with a readme file and said, here you go. Which is when I discovered that I didn't actually know who my audience was. That when I'd published hex offsets and the bytes you need to patch, and they'd said, oh, that's a little bit difficult. They weren't saying, I don't want to type in hex patches. They were saying, I don't know what hex patches are. So I had to rewrite all my docs, try and simplify the process which was a little bit problematic because the level of simplification that you need for an audience that is just end users, basically, who are not interested in breaking their firmware, is a level of streamlining that is hard to achieve when you're distributing patches to somebody else's firmware. I didn't want to redistribute Lenovo's binary objects. I don't know how I'd even go about asking information to that, but I'm fairly sure the answer would be no. So what I've published is a toolkit for editing those and will automatically download it for them, which is still a problem because a lot of them are on Windows. As it turns out, a lot of them who are interested in actually being able to do this were able to fire up a VM and install my tools inside the VM and combine all that information to get a binary patch that they could then flash onto their system. So that's when the other requests started coming in. Everybody had a different type of laptop to me. I had an X230. This guy had, an X, had a T430. And then there's about seven different models in this range where they're all like, can I support this too? Initially, I was a bit confused. Why would I be able to support this? I don't even have the hardware. But I got a, 
I got the firmware and I had a look inside it, and it turns out that the entire range, the X, X30 range of ThinkPad laptops, all had the same firmware layout. Not the same offsets, not exactly the same hardware, but close enough that I could find the same keyboard tables, create a new patch for each version, which made my repository a little bit more difficult to follow because I'd structured it assuming that I would need one laptop hardware and now I've got, I think there's eight in there, maybe nine. Not all of them have full patches, but it probably needs a bit of a restructure now that I've seen what I ended up using the, the, um, the repository for. And one of the ways I thought about simplifying it for people is instead of actually getting them to have to run a system to create a bootable disk and then take that bootable disk and reboot onto it, what if I could patch the firmware from the command line? They're already running a, a Unix command line because the tool set's are Unix. Maybe if I can work out how the tool that Lenovo provides actually talk to the firmware. How did it flash to the firmware? So this is where I went further than what I needed. And this is where I said, OK, I'm going to scratch my itch by trying to fix their problem. I was intrigued about how it worked. I thought there were some interesting questions about whether or not how the magic happened and whether or not it, it was something I could replace. And then just give them one project that they could boot up on bare metal. It would connect to the network, download the firmware, patch the firmware, and then run the tool on Linux to upload the new firmware to the hardware, which required me to actually reverse the tool that Lenovo provided. And it's not something you can easily trace to find out what it's doing, because it's a 32-bit application written to run under DOS, which means that there aren't that many tools that I could find to do it. And most of them didn't work very well for stuff that wanted to talk to the hardware. I can unpack it all. Turns out it was compiled by an open source product from the, the 90s. It, it was compiled by a program that was used to, for, to compile the original Doom. So it's all software that is open source, but I was able to download, find out the format of the EXE, and use that to unpack the 32-bit program that was inside it, which allowed me to host the DOS emu inside my, uh, sorry, host the DOS flash tool inside my own emulator. And using an LWN article, which was invaluable to do it, I was able to actually write my own KVM-based hypervisor that hosted this DOS flash tool and gave me trace output which meant that I could see, once I'd implemented all of the framework required to actually run a, this program, the basic framework, I could run it and get a trace of what it was talking to. I got all the interrupts it called, all the places that it opened files and their file names, and that's when I started to find that it was talking to the hardware, which I assumed was gonna be happening. It wasn't a surprise. But now I knew which hardware it was talking to it loaded various ACPI tables out of the firmware, the BIOS firmware, which gave me a place to start implementing. I had to actually implement the ACPI firmware, and then I found the SMM calls. Now this is the part where it actually talks to the hardware. Well, the hardware, because I could document the protocol that it was using to talk to the SMM, but the SMM's not actually hardware. The SMM is a more privileged mode of the CPU. I can't easily get into that, so I can't easily reverse engineer that, but I can reverse engineer the protocol. If you don't know what SMM is, your user code is normally run by a kernel. Your kernel is running inside a virtual machine hypervisor. Even more privileged than a hypervisor is this system management mode. And it's a little bit of code that sits inside your CPU that you can't talk to, that you can't run, that you can't edit. So it's in the BIOS firmware somewhere. I probably could find that. I didn't go that far because that's pretty much where my problems 
started. I couldn't give it the right answer that it was looking for. The DOS flash tool sent a, command, a protocol out to the SMM and got an answer that it didn't like, which was nothing because my emulator didn't know what answer to give it. From this point, I need to build a kernel driver that runs on real hardware, and the kernel driver can talk to the 64-bit or 32-bit high areas of memory that the ACPI tables point to. I have the wrong motherboard. I have a spare ThinkPad motherboard, but it's the wrong one for the laptop I actually need to work on. But it's still kind of dangerous to start trying to talk to the, the firmware and asking it to flash itself. So I haven't done much further on that. I haven't written the kernel driver. But I did wonder how this would be applicable to newer models. The various laptops that I've replaced this on have all been 2012 laptops. What if I actually wanted a modern laptop? I've been to upgrade my laptop by one year. So I looked at the other ones, the newer models from the same kind of ThinkPad range, and they all have the same kind of firmware layout. So they all have the same kind of tables. If I could physically shoehorn the keyboard in there, I could probably apply the same patch. The 250, I don't know how the encryption works, but I assume that I could reverse it the same way that Matt did for the X230. The latest model at the time I wrote this slide was the X260. I had a look at its firmware. It's not encrypted at all, but it does have another 256 bytes worth of stuff added to the end. So I assume it's actually going to be harder to work out because they've probably moved up their their, their game and cryptographically signing it so it's harder for some random person to replace your hardware, your, your firmware. They've subsequently re uh, announced a, a, an X270 laptop. They haven't released any firmware for it, so I haven't looked at it. And what are my next steps? Obviously, I should actually start using the laptop that I've hacked with this. I'm still using the old laptop because it hasn't broken yet. I'm worried that I'm going to run out of laptops. I've just got a stockpile at home of two or three of these laptops because that way when I break one, I can move on to the next least oldest one. They're all old though now. I know that I'm going to have to replace them at some point, so I can't just enjoy using the laptop that has this. I do intend to write the kernel driver that allow me to try and continue tracing the system management mode protocol, and I'll probably be doing that on my old X220 laptop motherboard. But I don't know if that'll go anywhere. And I don't know if it's applicable to modern hardware, so it may not actually help me. Another idea I had was to take the same physical hardware that I like and build an adapter. You can see it on the screen here. The adapter, you plug the hardware in, keyboard into, and it's got its own microcontroller and presents as a USB keyboard. Lenovo used to sell this. They used to have a keyboard you could buy with a USB dongle on the end of it that would do all of that. They don't sell it anymore. They sell a newer one. It has options with Bluetooth. It's a smaller case. And it's the wrong keyboard. So I can't buy them anymore. I used to be able to buy them. And if I get that small enough, I could probably fit it inside the laptop in one of the gaps. The newer keyboards on the newer laptops they have a different connector on them, but they're still probably a very similar electrical layout. So if I actually got one, I would try and pull it apart. Which also leads me to why I haven't got one, because it's a $1,500 expense that I know I'm going to attack with a Dremel as soon as I get it. <laughs> I can't justify that, so I'll keep using my old laptops until they all break. But crossing my fingers that I'll be able to solve that problem when they do all break. And obviously look for alternate laptops. There are a number of open laptop alternatives that are showing up. I mentioned the, the Purism and their Librem laptops earlier. They also don't have a keyboard that I want. I can't easily replace the keyboard on their laptop. Physically, it's got exactly the same problem. I'd have to attack it with a Dremel. There are things like the Pytop that are available. It has 
a Raspberry Pi inside it and a battery. Theoretically, it's a cheaper thing that I could replace the keyboard on. Using something like this adapter, I'd be able to put the keyboard I want into their laptop. So I'm hoping that there are more alternatives like that in the future. There's actually a guy wandering around with a, um, a Pi top here this week. He's, standing at, he's sitting at the back of the room there. I promised him that I'm going to go and measure his laptop so I can work out whether I can fit my, um, fit my keyboard in it later on. Hopefully he'll be around and won't be running away. And then maybe I'll buy one of them. But again, I've talked to those people. They can't sell me the keyboard part by itself. I'd have to buy the entire laptop. And then the first thing I'd do to it was attack it with a Dremel. It's a cheaper laptop, so maybe I should do that. But I know that it's a worse laptop, whereas I was hoping to get a better laptop. So that leaves me with a question for you. That what hardware have you got that you could improve, that you would like to improve, and hopefully that you feel like you can improve? And with some effort, be able to actually change the things that aren't built the way you want them to be built without just relying on the commercial enterprise to provide you with a new toy later. And that's the end of my talk. Hey. Thank you, Hamish. We have nine minutes for questions, so go wild. Oh, sorry, Adam. <laughs> it seems like we're fighting a bit of a losing battle here. You, we're stuck with older and older laptops as consumer electronics move ahead of what people want, or people here want, maybe. How do you kind of balance out the, the amount of work required to keep maintaining what you want? I don't see it as something that I charge by hour. I see it as me trying to balance out the thing that you're observing, the restriction of the laptops that I, and it seems like you, feel like we can have as a laptop we want. I want to try and balance that out by providing alternatives. Alternatives for me, but hopefully alternatives that other people can use and techniques that might be able to help other people as well. So I don't try and see it in hours. Yes, it's a, it's a quixotic task I've set myself. It is a task of fighting a losing battle. But how do I feel like I've got some say in my, in my hardware unless I feel like I can change it? So that's why I'm, I'm not seeing it in times of hours spent. Um, and hopefully there will be better alternatives in the future. We're seeing easier ways of people making small, small batch manufacturing. So maybe if I keep working on this, I'll be able to small batch manufacture something. And maybe that will give me a better laptop. Um, more of a comment than a question is that, I don't know if it'll help on the mechanical side of things with the keyboard, but um, Google actually uh, use an open source EC um, for their Chromebooks. So at least on the EC side of things, you'd have a, probably an easier time modifying the EC firmware if you could find something that was vaguely the right physical dimensions for your keyboard. Yep. And they have fairly mainstream CPUs, Intel as well as ARM. I've looked at the Chromebooks, um, and the problem I see with them is more physical. It's, they're, they're much slimmer line laptops, so it's a lot harder to physically get a different keyboard in there. With the island keys, you end up having the case forming part of the keyboard structure. So if I cut a big hole to put my keyboard in there, it might be harder to do. Um, I actually use, as my, my throwaway laptop that I take to conferences and traveling, I use a, a four-year-old Chromebook. Um, so I, I am trying to explore alternatives that don't leave me just going down a, a, a dead end of spending my life trying to hack old laptops. So I have looked at their embedded controller firmware as well, and it's all open source. I could learn enough to work that out. Interestingly, the, the ThinkPad laptops, there was a Google Summer of Code to replace the firmware on, um, I think it was a T40 or T42 laptop with a complete rewritten open source embedded controller firmware. Uh, so I looked at that as well, and you know, I think there's quite a lot of resources available to me for 
trying to work on the ThinkPads, which is another reason to stick with that. And I've got familiarity. Um, I think you said Lenovo does ThinkPad style Chromebooks. Um, I don't really want to give Lenovo my money because they have taken my keyboard away from me. I'm happy to buy second hand hardware because obviously that's not going directly to Lenovo, but I keep on seeing Lenovo hardware and going, oh, look, this is a nice improvement. They've done something cool. Why would I give them and reinforce their message that they are doing the right thing? So, you know, again, it's a quixotic opinion, but <laughs> I have discounted the Lenovo new hardware. I have one over here. How to get geeks skinny. It's, um, it's great to see someone saying, you know, I'd like this, this keyboard that I'm actually used to, you know, that I'm ergonomically suited to now, um, and how can I keep it? Do you, what are the other things that you'd like to add? Um, you know, features, you know, if you could start adding features in the firmware for the keyboard controller, the things that you'd like to do? Well, I'd like to know that there's nobody putting a keylogger in there. So um, we saw that there was quite a lot of empty splash in the end of this. There's quite a lot of room for adding extra code. So, you know, if, if we did work out, I didn't look at all in the peripherals, the hardware peripherals that are on the embedded controller. So if we did find enough of the embedded controller programming manual, we could add in all kinds of features that we wanted. I'm not sure what I'd want to add, though. I mean, usability things like removing the laptops, um, the, the battery uh, authentication, or making it optional to whether or not you detect that the wrong charger is plugged in. They all sound like things that are just usability. Um, there's, there's thermal profiles in there, there's the fan speed, but the, most of it looks like it's related to backlight control and the various little LEDs on there and what sound the boot makes when you plug the power in. Not really complex things, not really things that I feel an urge to change. I think I'd more want to actually make it transparent. The embedded controller could provide me with a basic autonomous brain to do the basic things that the laptop has to do even when it's off or crashed. But it could also provide me with a pass-through interface so I could write more advanced code on the real CPU. And I think that would be what I'd want to do. You know, then only after doing that and experiencing which things I wanted to run permanently, I'd be able to answer your question. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, really. Sorry. Right at the front here, back. So I know it's not quite a control that you want, uh, but at least I've noticed at Lenovo maybe a year or two ago, they made a survey asking us how many LEDs we wanted, where we wanted the keys to be put back to after they messed it all up. Uh, <laughs> Did you find that it helped a little bit, or is it still? Well, obviously, it's not one size fits all, right? But I, I did their survey. Right. <laughs> uh, the the um the the mythical I think is uh, X eighty four or something like that. They ha even had a code name for the laptop. Um, it hasn't eventuated. It's now a year and a half later, I think. It was good that they were asking the question. The questions that they were asking seemed the right questions. They seemed to be asking me where I wanted to have my keys. I'm like, that's great. They asked for my opinion. And then nothing happened. Um, reading the ThinkPad forums, well, skimming the ThinkPad forums, they, um, it does seem to be that one of the people who drove that project internally to ThinkPad either moved or moved jobs, moved departments or moved jobs. So it may not actually even happen. Crossing my fingers, because they may actually produce a laptop that has a classic keyboard, because they're calling it classic. Oh, yeah, and um, uh, I've, I've got some hardware. So Matt, Pew, and I will both have our bits of hardware up on the table if anybody wants to have a look. Show and tell after lunch, oh, during lunch after the talk. So we have uh, about a minute left. If there's any questions, or a very short question, or otherwise we can have an early mark for lunch. I can't see. No. Hamish, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And we have a. A gift from LCA. Thank you very much for ah. talking. Enjoy. Thank you. That's it. We're breaking for lunch.